Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our webinar tonight. Um, we've got people joining from all around the country so we'll get started straight away and as you know this event is called One Year On from the Climate Election to Climate Action and Why Now is so critical. So I'm Amanda McKenzie, I'm the CEO of the Climate Council so I'll facilitate tonight's event. But before we dig into some of those important topics that we'll be covering, I wanted to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we meet upon today. For me, that's the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay respect to elders past, present and emerging, and also to any uh, Indigenous people meeting us today on the webinar. I wanted to acknowledge that the land of Australia was never ceded and is always was and always will be Aboriginal land and acknowledge the leadership of First Nations people right around Australia in pursuing climate action and responding to the climate crisis. So please feel free to share in the chat where you are meeting us from. So our motivation for doing this webinar today is that around about a year ago, Australia elected the most progressive mm -hmm. parliament on climate action to date. So we had a green slide in southeast Queensland, climate action independents were elected across the country, a federal ALP came to power with a highly committed minister and a strong platform of reform. And we're now, you know, a year on from that. So what have we achieved and what is the serious work that still remains in this term and beyond through the rest of the decade? So we wanted to also share with you how the Climate Council has been responding, how we've adapted ourselves in uh, the last 12 months to this new environment. And uh, we often say that, you know, we the last 10 years, the Climate Council is almost 10 years old, we've been so focused on building the community and political will for change. And the last election really re represented kind of climbing to the top of that mountain. But the next mountain is overcoming the political gridlock to enable climate policy that's aligned with what we're all hoping to see, the scale and speed of change required. So tonight we're joined by Senator David Pocock, Jen Rayner and Simon Bradshaw, and I'll introduce them in a few minutes. and. Um, they're going to unpack the last 12 months and help us um, understand the next wave of work that's required to genuinely move Australia from a climate leader, sorry, a climate laggard to a climate leader. So just a reminder that this session is recorded as well, and uh, we'll send around the slides and the recording after the event. So I mentioned our special guest tonight, Senator David Pocock. Um, David was a captain of the Wallabies and vice captain uh, of the Brumbies as part of a stellar rugby career that I'm sure you've um, you've seen in the media. And he's been awarded for leadership on and off the field. He's also got a track record as a powerful advocate or advocate on issues from climate to marriage equality. And in 2021, he attended COP26, the climate summit, the UN climate summit, and led the cool down campaign that saw over 470 Australian athletes call on the Australian government to lift its ambition on climate change and that sort of engagement with uh, a sporting audience as well as athletes has been a really important part of how David's been engaging on climate action. And upon returning home from uh, COP26, he announced he'd run um, as a community endorsed independent in the seat of the ACT. So he was elected on the 21st of May last year. So welcome, David. Hi, Amanda. Great to be with, with, with you all. And I'll then introduce Jen Rayner. So she's the head of advocacy at the Climate Council. Jen leads our policy and political engagement across all levels of Australian government. And she's got a, a long history of working in Australian governments, getting solutions from um, energy and transport and a whole range of things on climate. So she's leading a whole range of our solutions work now. Hi, Jen. Hi, Amanda. Lovely to be with you all. And finally, we have Dr. Simon Bradshaw, who's Research Director at the Climate Council. So he's incredibly passionate about climate justice and the role of climate action in reducing poverty and inequality, having worked um, <clears throat> in a number of different major not-for-profits here and around the world. And his research covers so many different things, but particularly extreme weather, health, security, and other areas of climate science and impacts. So hi, Simon. Thanks, Amanda. Hey, everyone. Really looking forward to the next hour. So as I said, this webinar is focused on the year that's been after the, um, the election of the most climate-friendly parliament we've seen and a very new political context for the last uh, 
decade for all of us. So we as the Climate Council have been really navigating that, but so too have the politicians um, in Parliament House. And um, for us at the Climate Council, we've been drawing on that deep evidence base of our councillors and expert research team, our powerful communications machine, and it's added to our um, local and state capacity that we've been really building over years as advocates to then also build a federal a federal team to bring uh, bring expert policy making um, and uh, research to decision makers directly. Uh, we've also stepped up a counterpoint against powerful fossil fuel um, lobby campaigns via a whole range of our major polluters work and Jen might touch on that in, in a little bit. So we have seen some real progress in the parliament but we uh, you might remember the safeguard mechanism, which others will talk about through this and other um, other things like in the budget. But we've also seen coal mine approvals go ahead and fracking in the Northern Territory. So there is a nuanced line to walk between calling for the federal government to do far more and criticising them when they don't do the right thing, but then also working really constructively with them to do what, um, what we're asking for and to celebrate when they do do good. So it's a much more nuanced line than we might have had to play under the previous government. So we'll discuss all of that and more. So just to, uh, a reminder that today's discussion is brought to you by the Climate Council community and a cohort of really generous donors who make tax deductible donations to power our impact together. So you'll hear a little bit more about our work um, and uh, come back to that at the end as well. So, but first up, I'll go to our special guest, um, Senator David Pocock. Um, so David, as someone who's cared for a long time about this issue and advocated from climate from outside politics, really interested in your reflections of what it's been like to really get inside the tent and see it, um, how the sausage is made. <laughs> thanks, Amanda. Uh, uh, I mean, firstly, thanks to the Climate Council for all you've, you've done for, as you said, almost a decade now, and everyone on this call who supports their work, uh, whether financially or following along and, and and sharing the work that you do it it's been so critical having that voice for the last decade reminding us just how one important it is and two how out of step we are so as someone who was concerned and and sort of trying to do everything I could outside of politics to so actually be in, inside and, and seeing how things decisions get made has been eye-opening I think yeah, you're right, we have to celebrate the things that have happened and we have seen a huge amount of movement uh, over the last year. I think some some really good steps forward, uh, but I think we really can't kid ourselves just how far we have to go. And I think my, my biggest um, takeaway has been we we are now at the point where politicians know that we have to get on with climate action and they're talking about you know building a renewable superpower and investing in electrification and, and all the rest but they're also wanting to be a fossil fuel exporting superpower and ooh, i think we, we all know we can't have both and actually have a livable future. We we can't continue with expanding fossil fuels and protect the people and places we love. So, uh, you know, my my reflection has been some some good stuff, but really frustrating along the way. To be honest, like I think just seeing the major parties and how beholden they are to the fossil fuel industry, and I think now particularly gas. I think you know they've they've kind of moved on from coal a bit, but gas is 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 seriously still playing, I think, a big role in, in terms of the kind of ambition that we're seeing from, from the government. Absolutely, David, and um, that's an interesting reflection um, on that, the challenges of actually getting things done, even when you are in that, that house. Um, I wondered if you what you make of Australia's climate performance uh, to date and particularly unpacking some of the things that have progressed. Obviously, we have um, somewhat stronger targets. We have the safeguard mechanism. There were some positive things in the budget. What do you make of those interventions and how? Um, what, what is that progress compared to where we need to go from, from here? Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, there, there has there have been a bunch of of good steps forward you know the climate act actually legislating the target we all know 43 percent by 2030 is not enough but it's it's legislated and i think as part of that process uh, the crossbench was able to really push a, a bunch of things around transparency so now there is um the annual the uh, there's the annual statement on climate change that the minister has to deliver and uh, he has to uh, respond to advice from the climate change authority um, the you know the annual statement now includes climate risk assessments which i think are going to become more and more um, important and i think in terms of transparency we're now going to see the annual statement published um before the government makes their makes their decisions around our targets there was the ev uh fringe benefits tax um sort of measure that they brought through really trying to incentivize evs in in fleets uh, one of the big <laughs> fights we had was around pl plug-in hybrids and we were able to get them to phase uh, to sort of sunset FEVs uh, after the 1st of April 2025, which I think is a really important step. We've kind of lost the right to have that slower transition and we really have to decarbonise our, our transport um, sector. There were the energy price caps um, and as part of that, um, the, yeah, really pushed the government hard on, on electrification as did the Greens and, and that was delivered as a 1.5 billion dollars um, in the budget for electrification. So I think that is a that is a great step forward in terms of the the demand side and actually ensuring that households can benefit from the cost savings from electrification. You mentioned the safeguard mechanism. The most convoluted, uh, awful way to put a price on carbon. Right. This it just it just highlights how broken our politics around climate change is when you've got to devise this ridiculous scheme to put a price on carbon and only on, you know, the biggest 215 emitters. Um, but it is there and uh, in theory, it will ratchet down emissions over time. I think it's, it's, it's the kind of policy that is going to have to be revisited. You know, in the, I think it, it kind of highlighted just how far civil society and business have come where in the Senate committee hearings, you've got all sorts of business groups um, saying like, we should just have a carbon price. Like that's going to be a lot more effective for everyone in driving down emissions. But we, we know that, you know, politically that's probably not, not possible. So I guess we're here now with uh, legislated, uh, you know, legislation that's going to hold us to targets. And I think a lot of the states and, Territories are actually starting to show the kind of targets that should be possible, that we should be uh, aiming for. But at a federal level, I think it's really going to take us keeping the pressure on them and them going to the next election with a much more ambitious um, NDC for 2035. I think my reflection in hearing all of that from you, David, is that I think you've got a, a good understanding of that art of the possible. You can see this sense of vision about where we need to go but like what is achievable right now and I think the safeguard was a good example of that um, in terms of what can we get done right now but with the view we will need to get more done as it proceeds. Um, I wondered if you could reflect um, on working with Labor on this. It's one of the questions I get asked the most. Are they actually serious when you're having conversations with Chris Bowen and others? Do you feel like you are um, you're getting a degree of genuineness and people that want to take more action. Um, how is it sort of landing and having those conversations? Uh, it's 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 been it's been really interesting trying to trying to work out what's what's happening for them because you know, th these are smart people. They 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 know the science. They know what we're we're up against. They they know the challenge, um, and they know the consequences if we if we don't. Um, get this right um i mean you mentioned you mentioned the safeguard mechanism and and yes it was it was a massive uh, compromise to get something in place um and one of the things i often think about is, is you know what what does it mean to be pragmatic when we're faced with 
the challenge we are you know atmospheric physics doesn't give a give a damn about you know the the politics in australia um it just cares about you know parts per million and i think that's that's the challenge is that we've got the we've got this sort of social shift that we need to drive we've got a political shift um because we're we're up against the clock uh, you know, to be really honest it's been it's been it's been very frustrating to see the the lack of ambition um i guess a, you know a few examples um when it comes to tackling fugitive emissions and 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 methane like we know this is a massive massive issue in australia best estimates are that we underreport methane from um fugitive uh, methane emissions by 60% yet during the safeguard mechanism negotiations there was very little appetite to actually deal with that we've heard a lot made of aemo saying that there's a potential shortfall in the grid and that's being used to drive more gas projects yet we lose, we we lose through um you know leaks flaring and and venting two and a half times that projected shortfall so there's all these opportunities to to actually move forward and we're not seeing them and i guess the next the next big test for them will be um fuel efficiency standards like we 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 have to get that that policy right um you know the transport sector is a is growing in terms of uh emissions and you know looks set to become one, one of one of the the biggest um sources of emissions so we've really got to get this right so pretty frustrating uh, to, to be honest you uh, i think you can see the influence that the gas industry has on on the major parties um it, it, just in in terms of the the policy options they're going for like there's just too many examples the petroleum resource rent tax their yeah, their so-called um improvements to it like they are, it is mere tinkering that they hardly doing a thing to it and you know that's that's with the back backdrop of the fact that not a single offshore gas project has paid a single cent of petroleum resource rent tax like we've given all that gas away for free it's 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 extraordinary so um I, yeah i really do think like there's a whole host of things that have to go alongside this political donation reform um lobbying reform like i think you can you can kind of see why we're in this situation where we're not actually listening to to scientists sorry that's a bit of a that's a bit of a rant i hope that was coherent i saw a lot of um thumbs up and shocked expressions and hearts and other things so people were <laughs> really enjoying what you were saying, I think, David, and um, uh, and I think that's um, why it il illustrates why we've been up against it for so long, the power of the fossil fuel industry, and it hasn't just obviously been the coal industry, but the gas industry too. It's just that the gas industry is more in the spotlight now that coal is clearly on the way out um, in a big way and has lost so much of its social licence. Now gas is more in the spotlight and um, ourselves and many others have been you know, attacking the social license of gas, saying, you know, it is polluting. Why don't they pay tax? Why are they um, being poor corporate citizens? And actually, they're damaging our health, our environment, our well-being. Um, which is sort of a good segue, I think, into going uh, to Jen Rayner, who manages the Climate Council's work around um, polluters, as well as a number of other things. Um, and Jen, I wanted to ask you to take us through the Climate Council's advocacy work and strategy to get decision makers on all levels on a path to stronger, more ambitious climate action. And I know you have a short um, presentation to share with us to help us um, get to grips with what this, this looks like. Thanks so much, Amanda, and, and thank you, Senator, for that really interesting set of reflections on the year you've had. We've felt so fortunate to have the opportunity to work with you and your team to build stronger climate action and to work through really complex issues like the safeguard mechanism and know that there are people with your massively strong intent and goodwill in there trying to get these outcomes. So thank you um, from all of us for the work that you do. In talking about our advocacy program, and, and we'll go in a minute to what's changed in the last year, but one thing that has not changed for us here at the Climate Council is what drives us.
a swap get out of bed in the morning to do. And that is all about building a better future with a clean economy and protecting Australians from climate harm. That's why we do what we do and we know it's so important to all of you and that's why you're here this evening to hear about uh, how you might be able to support and uh, get involved in that work as well. And we know that we need to catalyse really strong action to drive deep cuts to pollution this decade because we are already in the crucial decade for action. We're a few years into it and so we need to be putting the foot on the accelerator. Since the federal election of 2022, Climate Council has refreshed our role and the, the work that we seek to do, but we are always staying true to the science and what the evidence says about what is needed this decade. So what we are seeking to do now in this moment is to be a couple of things to political decision makers and to the broader conversation about climate action in Australia. The first one is a, a catalyst and a source of ideas. So we have always played this really important role of looking over the horizon and putting things on the agenda to show what is needed now to drive real action. And that's just as important as it's ever been, regardless of who's in government federally. Another important role we have long played is as a source of truth. So really telling it like it is in terms of whether something that a government or a business or another actor in our conversation is doing is good enough and really calling it out when it's not. Together with all of you in our community, that makes us a powerful actor in these conversations. What we think really matters and we use our voice to guide the conversation towards strong action always. And the increasing role that we have played in the last 12 months is as, as a reliable advisor to the parliament and to the bureaucracy, to decision makers who are trying to work their way through to what strong climate action looks like, really setting the bar for them. And as I mentioned before, feeling really fortunate to have the opportunity to work with people like Senator Pocock and the most progressive parliament ever to actually do some of that work directly in a way that we couldn't previously under the last federal government, as well as doing that publicly. And the last one down the bottom, I think, is really important, and it goes to that point that Amanda raised at the start about us being an honest friend. So if something is good, we will say that it's good. But if something is bad, if something is not up to scratch, if it's only a first step in the right direction, then we will say that as well. And we will be clear about where the bar is and whether or not people are making progress towards it. If you have been uh, around Climate Council for a while, you would have seen our theory of change many times before. But I wanted to call out something that ha about how we relate this to the moment that we are in, because there's a couple of different pieces to it now, now that we can actually start moving forward in Australia um, since the federal election. So catalyzing change is all about those ideas. It's about saying what the science demands and then what that means we should do as practical solutions to take that forward. And what we now seek to do is lock in progress towards that. The safeguard mechanism is a really good example of that. As Senator Pocock said, not enough by any means, but a good step forward in genuinely causing industrial polluters in Australia to start driving down their emissions for the first time. So we want to lock in that progress. We want to take that win, but then we want to celebrate it and keep building on it because we know that we need to get an accelerating cycle of action this decade and we need to move further and faster than we are. So a lot of the work that we've been doing over over the last 12 months has really been focused on locking in that progress, getting things done that the government promised in their best possible version, putting new things on their agenda and locking those in, and then we can keep moving forward with the speed and scale that we need. And we particularly are focused in this moment on moving forward as quickly as possible without sparking that community backlash, which has seen us go one step forward, two steps backward in Australia in the past. We know that in this critical decade for action, we have to have constant forward momentum. And so that means we're always looking to be moving as fast as possible while bringing the Australian community with us. And we know that the community is asking for more. We've seen time and time again that there is fantastic appetite out there for strong community action. And often our job is actually demonstrating that to decision makers who might not have quite caught up with this whiplash of being in an environment where action on climate is actually a positive, not a negative. And so we've really mapped out the decade to look at what does it take to get to the extent of emissions reduction that we need? And what does that look like over the political side? 
cycle we have available for the work that we need to do. And we've identified there's these moments when we need to be working hard to lock in that progress and deliver things, which is what we're doing at the moment. And there are times when we will need to be pushing that envelope further, campaigning for and socialising things which are not currently on the government's agenda or on any party's agenda, but which are the next set of big ideas that we need to drive deep action. And so next year, for example, leading into a federal election again, terrifying to think we'll be back there already, but here we are. Uh, we will be doing that work of putting new things on the agenda. And then the cycle starts again. And that's how we get the accelerating action to deliver deep cuts this decade. So what does it actually look like to be building this momentum? Um, we had a great win in terms of the work that was possible through the safeguard mechanism with the parliament coming together to show that it could make climate policy. The policy itself has room for improvement, but the fact that the parliament was able to come together and make that policy sends a really fantastic signal about all the other great stuff that the parliament can now do. And so we really want to seize on that moment of opportunity to progress other much more impactful and important initiatives. So we've got a few different priority programs that we are working across. And the biggest priority really is obliterating the social license for fossil fuels and putting a stop to new projects. Because we know, and the International Energy Agency has been very clear, expert advice has been very clear, that we cannot have new fossil fuel projects if we are to have any hope of holding warming as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. So we're coming at that from a bunch of different angles. We are working on reducing the social license for fossil fuels through our fossil fuel free sponsorship code, which was launched just last week. Uh, we're fighting back against greenwashing and really going after companies that are lying to our faces about their action. And then we're working at that institutional and legal level as well to get strong reform of Australia's main federal environment law uh, to see it actually properly deal with climate impacts for the first time. In transport, as Senator Pocock says, really important space because emissions are going the wrong way at the moment and we need to get them down. And we know EVs are an important part of that story of which fuel efficiency standards will be a really central policy. But there's this whole other piece of the puzzle, which is actually about getting people out of their personal cars altogether and making a big shift to active and public transport because that's technology that's available right now. And if more people can make that shift, if governments can invest to support them to do that, then we can get really rapid emissions reduction this decade. And we had a great report out, Simon and his team um, produced that one just recently, showing what's actually really possible for emissions reduction through mode shift. We have some of our other programs which are working uh, outside the federal level of government um, to make sure that we're driving this action right across Australia. We're not putting all our eggs in that one federal basket. Um, so people would be aware of our city's power partnership, which really works on the ground in communities with local governments to drive the transformation of energy and transport and get local governments off gas and also be leaders for their communities in doing that because councils have their own operational emissions, but they also are leaders in their communities. And the local mayor talking about climate action and what people can do is often much more impactful than hearing about it from, you know, some greenie in the city or uh, from someone else who might not resonate in that community. So we go where people are and we, we start those conversations on the ground. And we also work to amplify the voices of people who are already really active in their communities and people who have important voices in the conversation that might not be being heard as much as they need to be. And I think we're all particularly proud of the work that the Climate Media Centre does to amplify and empower First Nation and Pacific Island voices to make sure that their experiences of climate change and of the action that needs to happen to protect their communities and their homes is really front and centre in the narrative. And then just finally, I, I talked about the need to keep accelerating action and find ways to drive towards 75% emissions reduction by 2030. And an exciting project that we are working on at the moment is our next wave initiative to really work out what's the next phase of action that we need. Once we've got, you know, fuel efficiency standards are strengthened and we've got a strong EPBC Act and we've 
obliterated the social license for fossil fuels, what's next? Because we are always working to be over the horizon, to be putting things on the agenda and to be leading the conversation in Australia about strong, impactful climate action. And so we are at the moment deep in the middle of some really fantastic and exciting research to uh, work out exactly what that should look like, what the next impactful opportunities are so that we can blast that out. So watch this space. I really want to emphasize that this isn't work that we can possibly do alone. Uh, we are so fortunate to have the support of all of you and our, our generous community to support the team at Climate Council, but this is a community-wide effort. I think we need, it's called the everything everywhere all at once approach, and that means all of you can play this really important role as well. So there's a few different actions there on the screen. Um, use our resources and the reports and the great evidence that we provide to just go and have conversations with friends, with family, with co-workers about the kind of action that we need in Australia and why we need to get it done now this decade. Um, I've come from a background working in political offices and, and one of the things that's actually most impactful is when the phone rings and it's someone from the local community saying, hey, this issue is really important to me and I want you to know that. So talk to your local MPs, federal, state, talk to your local government, let them know what's important to you for stronger climate action and let them know that you're looking to them to deliver it. And then I will give a plug for our Call Time campaign, which is really working to get fossil fuels out of sport and arts and public events. We've launched that just in the last fortnight or so, and it's one of the ways that we're going after the social licence for fossil fuels. So that's something if you're active on social media, you can really get involved in because we do need to call time on brands from fossil fuel companies slapping their logos all over the things that we love. And then, of course, because we're coming up to the end of the financial year, it is a great time to think about making a tax deductible donation for Climate Council as well. It is those donations that power the work that we do. So if you like what you see here, then we'd really encourage you to consider continuing supporting it. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thanks, Jen. Um, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, you can appreciate why I, I love working with Jen got a very crystal clear view on how the Climate Council should be operating in this political environment and has crafted an amazing strategy to take, take on these issues. And you can see that we're touching on a whole range of different issues. The big fights at the parliament will be or are and have been underway happening over this term, but also that next wave work that we're now really getting into around, well, what is next? And um, it's coming up more quickly than perhaps any of us uh, realise there could be an election as quickly as the middle of next year. So all of that work in preparing for what is next after this term and making sure that we're seeing the pace and scale of change that's required through the rest of the decade it is so important. Um, David, I thought I'd just go to you before we um, go to Simon as well, just on as um, now having that sort of politician hat, I wondered if you could reflect on what um, Jen has outlined in terms of the Climate Council's role, but how you have seen community groups in the parliament be most useful for that parliamentary process, helping to move things forward and get stronger action. I'd echo what Jen said about phones ringing. Um, you've got to have someone answering them. It's it's It can be uh, a lot of work, but you're... You, you're taking on board what people are saying if they if they go to the effort of 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 calling. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think the the cynical view is that at the end of the day, the thing that's going to shift politicians is votes, and I think we're we we saw that at the last election, um, people voting for candidates that are going to take this seriously, that are putting forward targets that are more in line with with science, and I. I think we're now seeing community independents stand up and say, well, I'm not a career politician, uh, which I'd say is a good thing, but I will go in there and, and vote on behalf of the people that I that I represent. And I've I've just it's it's honestly been such a, a privilege and a lot of fun, frankly, um, not having a party line to toe and on you know bills that are coming through on or different um, issues that we're facing of getting out, talking to people in the community, sitting down with experts, finding out, well, what solutions are there? What would that mean? What, what, what is possible? Um, and you know, my, my hope is that we, we do start to see this a bit of a, um, 
a speeding up of of these things as people realize that this this is not only a, an incredible opportunity for Australia, but we're also running up against the clock. Um, and we have a role to play globally to show that it can be done. Um, and that you can go from not taking it that seriously to actually leading in a, in a short short amount of time. So yeah, I, I do think we everyone's got a role. Everyone's got a role to play in this. Like the challenge is just too big to think, well, we'll just let let the experts and politicians get on with it. That's it's not going to happen if we if we do that. Absolutely, David. And I love all the hearts and the thumbs ups that are coming as you say that. That's the um, the strength of support that I know that people on this call, we're all seeking ways to have an impact on this issue. And there are many different ways to do it, whether it is calling a politician, whether it's making a donation, whether it's donating your time. There are so many ways for all of us to contribute, even though it can be intimidating just how large it is. But it's a puzzle that will only be solved by lots of people working on it together. Um, Simon, we're going to go to you now. Um, everyone on the call, I think, would know that the Climate Council for many years has been working on telling the story about extreme weather and how it's influenced by climate change, helping people join the dots when those events occur, particularly through projects like the Emergency Leaders for Climate Action. Um, people would remember during the floods, during the bushfires, the Emergency Leaders were front and centre with that really credible trusted voice telling the story about how climate change had made things worse and of course warning the previous previous government they in advance that they needed to do far more um, another project the climate media center is like a pr hub for climate that seeks to support a whole range of different voices from doctors to vets to farmers to people who have survived floods or fires to tell their story and again connect those dots in the climate council's view if you we need to be just constantly putting urgency on the agenda so simon we know that there's a possible el nino coming that we will of course see more climate extremes i wonder if you could tell us how this is related to um, a parliamentary term that may well end relatively um, quickly how do we continue to ensure that climate's at the top of the agenda not just for the last climate election, but for each election through this decade and um, beyond. And how can that urgency translate into the parliament doing more? Sure. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, David. I think the good news, first of all, to, to, to build on that lovely positive note from, from David just before, is that we have seen a tremendous public shift in public understanding of climate change in recent years, in what's at stake and what we need to do, and of course that translating through the public support and getting us to these new political circumstances that we are now in. And yes, we've got so far to go, but you know we've got to this point and we've got something to build on. And, you know, I find it's easy to forget that, um, you know, it didn't happen by accident of, of its own accord. You know, it took having Greg Mullins and emergency leaders for climate action out there during the Black Summer fires, talking to Australians every day, helping people understand what it was we were seeing, putting that in the context of climate change. You know, it's taken having those trusted voices all around the country, be it, you know, doctors in Western Sydney talking about the impacts of heat waves on school children, whether it's been you know, coal miners in areas that are going through this transition about what they see the future looking like, whether it's been uh, tourism operators on the Great Barrier Reef talking about what they're seeing and you know, how all of that together has you know, helped get us to this point. And you know, I think just restating what Amanda said there, it's something that we're incredibly proud of at Climate Council and that you, know, you should all be incredibly proud of as part of this community and what you've supported is, is that work, which has been, um, hugely important and um, I think we can't state that uh, too much. But I think especially um, Senator listening to your reflections and thanks again for those, um, you know, it just makes clearer than ever how much more we've got to do and so how this work, our Catalyst Program, the Climate Media Centre, that ongoing work of building that strong public story that we can all grab onto, so that's actually more important now than it's ever been. And we really need to keep working on that really hard because I think senators, you've made clear, we've got to do so much in these years ahead. And, and Jen, as you were saying, we've got to do that in ways that bring everybody along so that it doesn't fall over. And you know, David, as you told us, there really is a role for everybody in this. And we truly believe that. And you know, this is a make or break period. We're going to be going sadly into what will probably be a pretty confronting time 
uh, the Bureau of Meteorology said today there's now a 70% chance of us heading into another El Nino event. We probably will find ourselves you know, catapulted back into a period that is very hot, that's very dry, that's going to bring another raft of extreme weather risks. That's going to be challenging. And um, we've learned through some of our work this year, not only about some of what has to be done to adapt to these impacts, but of the mental toll of climate disasters and individuals and what we can be doing as Climate Council to be talking to those realities as well. So recognizing we're probably going into a difficult period. We need to do everything we can to ensure that that is galvanizing for the whole community. That yes, we're looking after each other and we're talking about ways to doing that, but that this is translating through into stronger, even stronger support for the kind of actions that we need to see that Jen and David have been talking about and that we are all giving it our best and taking that next step on this journey. And the other part of doing that, and why I think this work is so important, is we have to be driving that message of urgency. We're blessed to have this amazing group of scientists and economists and others who are so good at doing that. Um, but we have to be kind of communicating that message of action and hope and opportunity as well, and we can how we can all be a part of this. And I think that's where this work is just going to be so important going forward, because there is a really convenient truth here in Australia. We've been a big part of the problem previously. We're still sitting on this enormous untapped potential to help drive solutions. It starts with changing the way we produce energy, decarbonizing our own economy. Then we build from that to be replacing our fossil fuel exports with these prosperous new clean export industries, creating new jobs and prosperity along the way, just as we're doing everything we possibly can to be cutting our own emissions and playing our parts in tackling the climate crisis. Now that takes amazing policy work. It takes tremendous champions like Senator David inside the tent making that happen. It takes this ongoing work of building public supports. And it also just means you know, helping build that story that we all feel part of where, as we've heard, we all are recognizing our role in the solutions and we're giving these years ahead, everything we can, all of us, because anything less you know, is not gonna cut it. Um, and Jen mentioned that specifically, new things we want to be doing in particular. We're heading to this uh, moment in a few years where Australia will be on the global stage hosting a round of international climate negotiations. It's a few years away. We've got to have made real progress at that point and really be shifting the point of global leadership. We're thinking out across that whole arc, what it is that what we can do, how we can be supporting more of our friends in the region and their incredibly important leadership and perspectives on, on what we're seeing and how we can continue to support traditional owners in through litigation cases, fighting to protect country, but also how we can be sharing stories of how people in the suburbs are getting off gas and are improving their homes so that they are saving on power bills and also playing a part in tackling the climate crisis. So as Jen said, everything, everywhere, all at once in the policy sense, in an advocacy sense, and then in doing all we can to really work together to, um, to give it everything we can over the coming years. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, that was uh, you do such a good job of weaving together the challenges we face with a strong message of hope, which was always it leaves me really buoyant um, when I hear you speak. And I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on the international uh, situation. Obviously, Biden was going to be here a few weeks mm -hmm. ago, and there was an important announcement made with the government. Um, what if you could reflect on how what is happening internationally is influencing the Australian government? what that um, the COP may mean, um, what it's meant maybe in other contexts. Mm. Look, the world is changing. And, you know, I think quicker than we sometimes realise. And, you know, we have reached a tipping point where it's not having fast enough, happening fast enough. We've got to accelerate it. But, you know, the world is going to be moving out of fossil fuels. There's a real race on now for the clean energy future. And um, you see how this is sort of reshaping our economic environment, how it's reshaping our security environment, how it's reshaping global geopolitics. Now, Australia really can be central to all of this because we are sitting on so much of what the world needs in order to be building a prosperous clean energy future. Now, obviously, we have dragged our heels for a long time and we're now starting the back with the game, we have to work very quickly to sort of catch up with where a lot of our international peers are and then to be you know, really tapping into our natural advantage when it comes to playing what can be a really outsized role in the world's response to climate change. 
I think one of the joys of the role I'm in is have been able to see up close, you know, some of how Australia is being perceived and what's being said about us globally. And there's a tremendous amount of relief that we're back in the game, but there's also some caution as well, uh, because as David's pointed out, we're still approving fossil fuel projects. We spent the last kind of decade trying to dig up stuff as fast as we can and put the brakes on global action. And I think there's probably now a lot of anticipation, a lot of hope that we are serious about playing our part. And I think we want to keep having that international pressure from the Pacific, from our peers globally. And by committing to host this round of international climate talks, we are going to be putting ourselves out there. And this is Australia saying, hey, we don't just want to catch up. We want to be in a leadership role. And that's going to bring expectations. And that will be coming halfway through this make or break decade. And at that point, a lot of what we talk about now in terms of being a renewable energy superpower playing this role, that's got to be getting real. You know, we've got to really turn the ship, have our emissions plummeting, be leaving our coal and gas in the ground and starting to realize that potential because, you know, the world is going to hold us to account to that just as, of course, Australians are going to be holding our governments to account too. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you, Simon. And um, I'm going to move to some questions from uh, you in the audience now. Some came in advance and I've been trying to just keep across the ones that are coming through and get a bit of a flavour for what's coming. Um, I thought I'd start with you, Jen. Something that's come up a lot in a variety of different ways is the question of why are fossil fuel companies so powerful? Why have they been so influential in the government and how would we change that? I think there's it's such an important question and there's two answers to that. Uh, one is that they spend an enormous amount of money buying social licence and social capital and political capital and that's through things like the advertising that they do on our sports teams and the amount of money that they spend in our communities and then the ways that they promote their contribution economically and socially as well. And so there's a really big piece about actually diminishing the social licence that they have. While ever Australians still think of fossil fuel companies as great local firms that are doing good things for our economy, it's going to be really hard for politicians to actually say no more to their projects. So there's a community facing piece about really ending their social license. And then there's also a piece about governments feeling like they really need to make sure that the lights stay on and that we have reliable and stable energy through this transition. And the fossil fuel industry has been incredibly successful so far at convincing decision makers that that means fossil fuels. So that's the only way that we can be uh, having reliable power as we make this transition. And all of us on this call know that's not the case and that renewables are the answer and that we need to roll those out as fast as possible at the greatest scale possible, backed up by things like storage. And so there's a genuine education and engagement piece to say to decision makers, look, you've heard for 20 years that fossil fuels are the way to get an energy, a reliable energy system. That's just not the case anymore. Look at what's possible with renewables. Look at what's possible with storage. Let's go down that route and let's embrace that as hard and as fast as we can. So I think there's two pieces to that. There's diminishing the social license piece and then there's the genuine education, engagement, upskilling piece to make sure they understand that we can keep the lights on, we can have a better energy system um, as we move to renewables. Thanks, Jen. Uh, David, I wonder if you could reflect further on the comments you made earlier around um, fossil fuel donations <clears throat> as well. What is, the, what is the state of play that we're facing right now and <laughs> what, what are you proposing and other independents proposing in terms of that donation reform? Well, they, they donate to all the major parties um, and I think another part of it is the revolving door that we see between politics and the fossil fuel industry and the way that you even look at some of our our bodies that are um <clears throat> you know set up to provide climate advice having fossil fuel executives on them like i think we've the whole thing has just become so murky that we really do need i i believe really big reforms when it comes to um political donations and also lobbying reform at the moment we we've got this um on the on the political donation reform there's a government review that will recommend um changes uh you know, as a crossbench we're sort of talking about what 
we think and what we're hearing from people should should happen, but really waiting to see what the government proposes as as part of it. The the biggest eye opener for me has been around lobbying. Like it is just outrageous. Um, there are nineteen hundred people with sponsored passes. As a parliamentarian, I can give all of you, uh, you know, a sponsored pass if I've known you for twelve months, and if I haven't, you can provide a supporting letter, and you can access the building twenty four seven. Uh, do whatever lobbying you want. And there's currently 1,900 people who we've got no idea who they are. Separately, you've got the lobbyist register, which is the loosest arrangement you can imagine. It's it's not even, you know, you look at the US, UK, you can have civil criminal penalties if you break the lobbying um, code of conduct. Here, the worst that can happen to you is that you get stood down from lobbying for three months like have a three-month holiday mate and then you can get back at it like it's it's just ridiculous um so I, yeah, I think there's a there's a huge amount of work to do on on all fronts um and I know there's various cross benches sort of working on on different just different aspects of it mm. thanks David that's a really valuable insight um, Simon, I wanted to go back to you. Uh, we're coming up close to the to the end of our webinar, but just wanted to ask you about something that's come up a quite a bit as well is around um, Australia's emission reduction targets. And of course, that conversation is starting off again with the COP at the end of the year. Um, how does we obviously had that reform last year? But what would be um, scientifically aligned targets? And how has the world reacted to us upping our targets so far? And what's the expectation going forward? Thanks, Amanda. So look, to keep it really simple, the world has to roughly halve its emissions by the end of the decades and reach net zero as soon as possible after that. So for a country like Australia, where we've got so much wealth, high emissions, tremendous untapped renewable energy potential, you know, we need to be doing much better than that. And I think uh, Climate Council sort of working from our wonderful team of scientists and other experts put out there, a couple of years ago, that we should aim to reduce emissions by 75% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2035. And beyond that, be reaching a real zero as soon as possible, starting to draw more carbon down from the atmosphere. So what that means is we are in a much better place than we are previously, but it's got to be a case of continually ratcheting up that ambition. All countries, but you know, Australia in particular, and there's so much more we can be doing there. We certainly do talk about those targets, but you know, I think I'm very much focused on the action needed to get there as well and how we really get on that train, speed it up, get into a virtuous cycle that starts to see our emissions plummet. And I think what we've learned as well is there are no sort of technical insurmountable economic problems to get into those sorts of reductions. It is about the political leadership, it's about the smart policy, it's about us all playing our part. So to put that even simply, we need to get our emissions on a very steep downward curve within the next couple of years. Uh, we need ideally to be getting to around 75% by 2030. And then we're going to be holding firm when it comes to the 2035 target that that needs to be net zero and that we need to be focusing on everything we can do in the near term, near term to get us there. And that's what the science compels. And that's what we believe is possible. And that's what, what we're all going to be going for. Mm -hmm. Um, Jen, um, as we you know go out into the community and um, to business, politicians, others often say that you know that's unrealistic. So that's not where we should aim. And how would we even get there? Um, and there's some questions in the chat about can we meet these aspirational goals around the scale of renewables and um, transport changes, etc. Um, what's the answer to that question? I think the real answer is we'll never get there if we're not trying. And so we need to throw everything at this challenge. There's no question that getting to a fully renewable powered grid and driving down transport emissions and ending fossil fuels is a big shift from where we've been in Australia. But Simon's right that we have all of the technology and all of the capability that we need right now to, to make that shift in the energy system and to make it in our transport system in particular. Um, and so it's a matter 
of will. It's a matter of investment. It's a matter of coordination and sending the right signals. And it's a matter of everybody believing that this is possible. And I've been really interested to see in the chat tonight, there's a lot of people sort of expressing some dismay and some concern about the pace that things are moving. I think as someone who's really working at the coalface of this, there is a palpable sense of momentum and us moving forward in the last 12 months. And we need to be continuing to accelerate that. But I, I would say that we need to all be on the same page and driving forward about what's important, um, because that's how we send the message to our decision makers, to the companies that we support, to the uh, companies that we invest in ourselves to make this really big transition. Thanks, Jen. And just as we go to close the webinar, I'd like to hear from each of you. If um, if you could get whatever you wanted done in the next year and then in the next um, sort of seven years to the end of the decade, what would it look like for our parliament to be hugely successful in, in tackling climate change? What's the vision you'd like to see? And I'll start with you, David. Um, just a small question to finish. <laughs> <laughs> I think clearly upping upping our ambition when it comes to the transition, seeing, uh, I guess, policies that are going to unlock far more uh, capital into the transition to renewables, more investment in industries of, of the future. I'd like to see more support for households, I think particularly for low-income households, people in social housing. That's a real opportunity for people to be saving, you know, not a once-off $500 relief on your energy bill, like thousands of dollars every year year um i i am you know then you've got epbc reform nature you know i think that really has to be a focus and we're gonna have to have some some really frank conversations about these big renewable energy projects and their ecological impact how do we um you know minimize that and and mitigate it where we can really concerningly for me that i think one of the things that we really aren't grappling with enough is investing in adaptation like as much as we mitigate we know we've baked in a lot of warming already and i really think that is the conversation that we're going to have to try and find the bandwidth for alongside reducing emissions saying okay well how do we invest in more resilient communities what does that what does that look like um so some some seriously big challenges ahead but we're up to it you know we can do incredible things when we when we um we work together absolutely thank you um jen what's your um quick response I think it would look like us having a really clear national plan for how we're moving beyond fossil fuels. And that means being clear about how we are ending new projects and also what new industries are going to take their place, clean industries, so that we can have a plan for getting out of fossil fuels for good. Great. And Simon? I think the vision, I love what you said there, David, that, you know, we're up for it. Australians are up for it. I think they really are, you know, and I think we're getting to understand um, not only the danger of what we're looking at, but the opportunity we've got to do so much good in the current moment and that the decisions we make now are going to be felt within the lifetime of people alive today, the benefits, but out over many, many generations, there's so much at stake and every smart decision, every smart policy choice is creating a brighter, safer future for all of us. So I think my vision is that we have that galvanizing moment where everyone sees their part where everybody is up for it and we throw everything we've got at it over the coming years because it's what it's going to take. Thanks, Simon. And thank you to all of our speakers and uh, particularly Senator David Pocock for joining us as our special guest. I think um, everyone on, on today, there's been a lot of love for you, David, and um, fighting the good fight from inside Parliament, which is certainly not always easy. So thank you for, for all of the work that you do, you do being a climate champion. Um, and thank you, Jen and Simon. It's wonderful to work with, with you and to hear your perspectives. And thank you, everyone, on the chat. Um, loved all the ideas and um, thoughts and, and chat going on there too. So thank you for being so engaged. Um, our work, as you probably know, is made possible by each and every one of you. We're completely community funded. We don't take corporate or government funding. So please consider joining us as a member before June 30 to support our independent evidence-based information solutions advocacy work and you can see the links in the chat or go straight to our website you can become a climate champion or just make a one-off donation to the climate council to keep us going 
um, this work is so important. And I think some people have thought, you know, Labor's elected, this is solved, obviously, from this conversation. It's certainly not. There's so much that we've got to do together. So we'd really appreciate you um, getting on board if you haven't already. So I hope you really enjoyed tonight's discussion. You'll get an email with the recording as well as uh, a link to the survey so you can give us some feedback how we can do things um, better. But we'd love it if you could share the recording with your friends and family if you think they'd be interested. And thank you so much for your engagement and um, jumping on tonight. It's been lovely to be a part of it. Thank you and good night. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everyone.